Live from the 607, it's the Ocho Duro Parlay Hour, where we're talking everything movies, TV, comics, and entertainment. Join in the conversation on social media with the hashtag ODPH, because here we go. Welcome back for an all-new edition of the ODPH Podcast, better known as the Ocho Duro Parlay Hour. What is happening, everybody? Thank you so much for joining us this week. My name is Ken M. Joining me in studio, as always, you know him. He's the co-host. His name is Padawan J. Hello, hello, hello. Folks, we have a lot to talk about in movies, TV, comics, and more. You are tuned in to the entertainment edition of the podcast. You can tell how amped we are because we just popped the microphones, but that's why we're excited to talk to you, and we want to continue that conversation after the show. So swing on over to odphpodcast.com. Join in the conversation on all our social media accounts. They're right there on the front page. You can check out Parlay Points. New comic reviews up this week, so if you're going to the local comic shop, you got to stop by there first. No questions asked. The classified section, the T Public Store, the directory, if it's anything and everything that is the ODPH, it can be found simply at odphpodcast.com. And always remember on social media, use the hashtag ODPHpod. Kicking off this edition of the podcast, though, we have to recap the biggest movie in all of Hollywood, Mm -hmm. in all the world right now. Marvel Studios came back in a big way to kick off their next phase. With the one and only Doctor Strange in the Multiverse of Madness. Yeah. So, Pad, this one we've all been waiting for. It's been a lot of hype because technically we've been waiting around for this movie since WandaVision came out yep. last year on yep. Disney+. Plus. And to see the chronological order that's been going from WandaVision to What If to Spider-Man No Way Home... It has been a journey to get here. Also, Loki in the, in the midst of that. That's true. Even so, this is where the phrase multiverse really jumped into play. Oh, yeah. And obviously, as fans, everybody's been chomping at the bit to see what's been going on here. There's been so much hype behind this movie and who was going to be in it. It's mm-hmm. been rumored this actor is going to be in This actress is going to appear. It was all over the place so much that, honestly... We had no idea what to expect. No. Other than, okay, who's going to be in this movie that we know? And obviously, Benedict Cumberbatch reprising his role as Doctor Strange. Elizabeth Olsen reprising her role as Wanda Maximoff. And you had some new characters get introduced. Uh, Zoel Gomez Mm -hmm. that is playing America Chavez. And that was going to be a big factor going into a next phase of everything. That is Marvel's big plan going into the new direction of Phase 4. Yeah. So, this movie did extremely well at the box office. Yeah, it did. You got numbers ready, Pat? I do. Uh, so, over the weekend, it was obviously the number one movie at the box office. Uh, taking in $187.4 million. Uh, like I said, making it number one ahead of uh, films such as The Bad Guys and Sonic the Hedgehog 2. Uh, and then, uh, for total, uh, up to date as of this recording, it has made $213.6 million domestically. $294.2 million internationally for a worldwide total of over $507.8 million. I would have to say that Sam Raimi and company behind the production of this have to be extremely happy about this. Oh, yeah. Marvel's got to be ecstatic because for anybody that's worried about superhero burnout, yeah, I think you have to look at numbers like this and go, Also, the what last burnout? five, ten years because people have been saying this for five, ten years and yet it's not happened. Exactly, because Marvel Studios and the MCU has now become the brand. And I know we talk about this a lot in the ODPH, but if you're turning in for the first time, very much when you become pop culture, mm-hmm. you transcend out of the comic book realm. It's become the norm. Right. It's become the reflex to go like when a Marvel movie drops, you stop everything and go, no matter if it looks great, it looks horrible, it looks indifferent. You go. And obviously, this movie had a lot of hype going off the last big blockbuster they had, oh, yeah. which was Spider-Man No Way Home. So we were all waiting to see how this all played out. So that being said, we're going to give you our spoiler-free statement before we go deep diving into this movie. So, Pad... Spoiler-free talk. Let's hear it. I thought it was a really good movie. Not necessarily my favorite one of all time, but I did still enjoy it at the end of the day. 
a little confused on some things, you know, and obviously it might have been some red herrings from the trailer to what we actually saw uh, on screen. But overall, I did love the movie. I did like this movie a lot. I will not crown it the greatest MCU movie of all time, like I've read some people have been doing. But I was very excited about this. Uh, Zochitl Gomez, Mm -hmm. who played American Chavez, I thought was stealing a lot of scenes. And this is great for what the next direction of the MCU is going to be in. Benedict Cumberbatch played a phenomenal role in this as well. Elizabeth Olsen definitely had a breakout performance in my eyes with this role. And just how this all came together, for anybody that was questioning about the multiverse and what it meant, I thought they fully delivered and leaving the door open for more. So that said, that's our spoiler-free talk. Now we're going to deep dive into spoilers. So if you're new to the ODPH, first and foremost, thank you for giving us a shot. But we go into spoilers after the countdown. So if you don't want to hear any spoilers, we put the liner notes when we start talking about this. So you can just pause the episode and jump in after you've caught up because we don't want to ruin this for anybody. So that said, in three, two, one. Pad, what did you think about Doctor Strange 2? Like I said, it was a really great movie overall. You know, had some issues with what was presented to us on in the trailer specifically. The what appeared to be the Strange Supreme or whatever from the What If showing up in the trailer going, oh, now things are out of hand. And then what we saw on screen kind of left me confused. Dug the cameos and I dug the surprises. I got to hear one of my favorite uh, musical cues of all time. God damn it. Uh, but overall, I really liked the movie. This movie delivered on great fan service. It gave us a tease of the Illuminati and what's coming with that. Mm -hmm. Because if you're not familiar with the comics, I have two words for you. It's called Secret Wars. You might want to start reading up on it right now. Yeah, because they're kind of working towards that. Oh, they're getting there. We've talked about this at length before that if there's one film project, the Russo brothers, the brains behind Infinity War and Endgame, we're going to come back to the MCU for it was Secret Wars. This has been kind of like a little sprinkle mm-hmm. of where they might go with things. It's like and an I, appetizer. Yeah, and I think they they absolutely pulled it off because there was so much going on with this movie for different directions, and I think they gave us one of the biggest teases slash confirmations of where we're going with a certain team that mm-hmm. is called the Fantastic Four with the one only John Krasinski playing Reed Richards in this uh-huh. film. There is no chance... And I repeat this. There is no chance he is not coming back for more. Uh, and for one reason I will mention when we get to one shots. Mm-hmm. It, it's a lock. They would not do that to the fans and go into a different direction, in my opinion. Like, I, I yeah. just I can't see them doing that. I think they might go in some different directions with the X-Men franchise. Sure. And that's perfect. That's I have no issue with that. But I think for as far as the Fantastic Four, the tease they gave us here... I think it's lock, stock, and barrel. Krasinski will be the one walking out on Hall H at San Diego Comic-Con this year with the rest of the cast. And I, I'm going to say that's my leap. They announced the casting for Fantastic Four Maybe. this year. But let's jump into this movie. And I have to say, it was kind of a surprise to see how they kicked off because we were really kind of thrown right into Let's Get Weird Land mm-hmm. because you saw America Chavez running around with a Stephen Strange. Mm-hmm. Now, this was not the Doctor Strange we all know. Yeah, and clearly they made it look as such. Right. And they were running and trying to go get a book at the time. Now, we weren't sure at this moment exactly what they were doing. Just they were running from something. A demon of sorts was yeah. coming after him. Yep. It's Doctor Strange, and if you're not familiar with the, with the Master of Mystic Arts... There's a lot of weird stuff that goes on in his book. This is par for the course. Yeah, this is normal if you read the comics. If this is like, well, I just saw him in Avengers. I'm going to check this out. No, this is more traditional of the comics. And I love how Sam Raimi captured the vibe for this. Mm -hmm. Because there's just a lot of weird crap that goes on in his book. And as you see, they're fighting this monster that goes through. You see America Chavez activates her powers, which she can travel through the multiverse. Yep. And she winds up escaping this realm before the demon comes after her or so right. she thinks well and then the demon tries taking her powers but you know the doctor strange we see in this universe uh on, on the brink of death uh does one final act of uh desperation and maybe heroism uh to free her and, and save her mm-hmm. so she now escapes to the 616 universe earth prime if you will 
the MCU that we all know and love. Uh huh. And when she gets there, she has to get saved by Doctor Strange, who's at the wedding of his ex. Awkward. Yeah, that's just kind of a weird scene to see, but it is what it is. And he comes in. There's a very cool action sequence where yeah. you know he's taking on the creature. And I know there's kind of some back and forth about who the creature is. I know it's from Namor's background. Mm-hmm. Either way, it doesn't really matter too much because that thing was cool to see visually. Yeah. And you got a tempo for how this movie was going to go with how they took this creature out because it had God one damn. eye. God damn. And, Pad, what happened there? Uh, Doctor Strange took a light pole, broke it off the ground. Uh, and then threw it into this thing's eye and then pulled it backwards so that the eye became detached from the body. Yeah. Like, we got wild, we got weird, no shame in this, let's go. Uh Uh-huh. So after they gruesomely kill off this creature, uh, we see that Wong shows up to as he is now the Sorcerer Supreme of this universe. Right. Benedict Wong. I mean, what can you say about him? He's always great in whatever he plays. So, so it's, good. It's awesome to see him reappear in the MCU. And they now have the sit-down, and they're trying to figure out, okay, what's going on with America Chavez, and who would be coming after her? Right. And Doctor Strange has kind of an idea what's going on mm-hmm. because he notices kind of this weird aura around that creature. Right. So he goes, hmm... This isn't normal sorcery. This isn't normal magic. Right. It's witchcraft. Mm Mm-hmm. And, Pad, who is the only witch that we know of in the MCU, for Uh, the most part? Wanda. Yes. So, Doctor Strange decides to go see what Wanda is up to. Now, Mm, granted, we have... About goddamn time. Yeah. And I know that there's a great online question by our guy JVD from Crossover Collision about what should Wanda have been unseen this entire time because she just kind of disappeared off the radar. And I think of this situation, she's hidden herself from the world pretty well. Obviously from the events of WandaVision, she's got to make herself disappear. I mean, she's in the middle of nowhere. I think she's in the middle of a mountain range. I think it's definitely a case of she got left on check because, Hey, you're an adventure and you just help, help save the world. And then she enslaved an entire town which they didn't pick up on initially, but then things kind of went weird, and you basically had like an off-brand brands of Shield mm-hmm. show up, try to stop her, and they couldn't stop her. So I think it's not necessarily a case of like hiding in the in the mystic arts or the, like the magic sense. I think it's just she's in the middle of nowhere, and no one knows where she is. Yeah, and I think that she's one of those beings in the MCU that they don't want to provoke. Mm-hmm. Cons- considering she just enslaved an entire town and they knew what she was doing. Like, and when I say they, I mean the townspeople knew what she was doing. And they're like, okay, yeah, we don't want to fuck with us. Exactly, because they're worried what she is capable of. Because if you know her from the comics, the Scarlet Witch is one of the most powerful beings in all of the MCU. Uh-huh. And she can be either hero or villain, depending on how it's written. And she is such a such a fascinating character. And Elizabeth Olsen does such an amazing job playing her as yeah. well, too. That when Doctor Strange shows up and is going like, so there was a creature that was coming after this time traveler, and it kind of reeks of witchcraft. Mm, and, there uh, were some markings on its limbs, and you know what? I kind of recognize those, and I know you're the only one who can help me. Yeah, so uh, you want to talk about this at all? Sure, I'd love to help you. Yeah, and we find out that, well... Wanda got a big power boost. Well, and she tips her hand because Strange doesn't say her name at any point, but she says the name before he does. Mm -hmm. And he basically has that moment of what, like, how did you know that was her name? And she goes, oh, and she she basically says, oh, did I reveal too much too soon? Yeah. So it comes to find out that she is the one chasing after America Chavez. Well, and she's living in this, what seems to be idyllic, you know, peaceful setting in the, in like a mountain Valley. Mm-hmm. With like trees that are blooming flowers and she's, you know, trimming the flowers and all this and that. But then as soon as the truth gets revealed, she starts working her magic mumbo jumbo and it is like a hellscape on earth. Every tree is dead. The ground is dead. The sky is red. Like what the shit? The only thing I was putting together from this is we know at the end of WandaVision, she was in the cabin mm-hmm. and starting to go through the dark hole. Yeah. And what I'm thinking is the Darkhold possessed her. Oh, well, we know that's the case. Right. And thus, that was the that's the cabin, and that's where she's been the entire time, so that she's disappeared. Probably. But, but, the, but the Darkhold magic has kind of shielded her away from most people. Yeah. But you're not going to shield away from Doctor Strange. So at this point, 
well, things get very awkward yeah. amongst the team. And you do see that, well, there is a play on America Chavez again because Dr. Strange is basically saying, you're not going to get her. No, because Wanda basically tells him, eh, give me her or else. Yes. And, and you're she... not going to like the or else because I'm being very kind to you right now. Exactly. So she's trying to be diplomatic about this. And Strange is like, yeah, no. I know what the dark hole does. I know what it's done to you. I don't like the outcome of that uh, equation. Yeah, this this isn't going to work for me. I don't know. You can talk to my agent. We might be able to work something out. And she is basically saying, "No, here's the ultimatum. You give me the girl, and everybody lives. If you don't, well, you know reasons." So Strange takes his information back to Wong. They mm-hmm. go back to Kamar Taj. Mm-hmm. So they have now this army of sorcerers and training. I think it's like the entire school. Yes. Getting ready to protect America Chavez because they know that Wanda is now coming and for her. And she's going to be damn near impossible to stop. Yeah. And this is a great action sequence yeah. too when she shows up. They go full tilt about this. And you see that Wanda is desperately trying to get a hold of America Chavez, tearing through the forces little by little, even doing like a little mind possession mm-hmm. to cause a break in the shields that they're doing. Yep. It's so cool of just how they do the takeover, but she basically eradicates everybody on Kamar Taj. Mm-hmm. And this is such a wild scenario to see because at this school, everybody is a very powerful being for the most part. Well, and you had to also factor in there's two Sorcerer Supremes there. And, and I know one's an ex-Sorcerer Supreme. No, but let's face it, it's Doctor Strange. It, you got Doctor Strange, who was the Sorcerer Supreme. You've got Wong, who is the Sorcerer Supreme. Listen, they don't, you know, give those titles out diplomatically mm-hmm. or, or electorally. You know, they, you don't get everybody together. All right, folks, we, these are our nominees for uh, Sorcerer Supreme. Uh, put your secret ballots in the box and we'll count the votes and see who, you know, this ain't Survivor, you know. Yeah. He's Sorcerer Supreme for a reason. So you have two very strong individuals. And this is Wanda, who, mind you, the last time we saw her powers in battle action, not, mm-hmm. in, not in terms of like just using them, but the last time she fought and used them, was Endgame. Yeah. And she w- was probably could have killed Thanos if she wanted to. I just don't think she was quite there yet power level-wise. No, she wasn't at that level yet. But now she could possess his mind and make him tap dance like he's Shirley Temple if she wanted to. They could go into a lot of different directions now with that, her being at this power scale. Because the Dark yeah. Hold is just such a force in, in it's, a it's power own right. Boost. Oh, absolutely. Like, we've always seen this from Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. to now, and especially in the comics. It is a very, very tricky situation to master, mm-hmm. let alone use for good, because it just doesn't happen. Because it's basically the book of evil, for the most part. I mean, it reminded me a lot of Broly from Dragon Ball. Mm-hmm. Where, like, Broly's already very fucking strong to begin with. But then you piss him off. And it just boosts his power all that much more. Wanda, strong to begin with. Pissed her off. Look what it did. Exactly. So there's a great sequence of little back and forth. Camera work was all over the place for this, too. And I don't mean that in a bad thing. This had such a horror vibe to it. Oh, yeah. Like, it played it played right in the Sam Raimi's wheelhouse right there. This so, is essentially like Evil Dead 4. Oh, my God, yeah. And they do some very cool things where Wanda's coming through the mirrors and reflections. Well, because uh, Strange at one point locks her in the mirror dimension or, or traps her in the mirror dimension. And, like, she's like, oh, I can just simply go walk through this door and I'll, it'll be perfectly fine. But then, like, a thousand and one mirror dagger or whatever the hell they were, they were sharp objects, come pointing at her and basically have her trapped. And that's when she figures out, oh, and then she figures it out and she starts trying to come through the water. And the, and the reflections. Yeah. So it's such a cool action sequence to see. And then you see America Chavez panics at this stage because obviously mm-hmm. she knows her life's in danger. And she opens up another portal. Uh-huh. And her and Doctor Strange go through it. That was a cool montage after they went through. Very, very cool montage where they did show some different places in the MCU that we haven't seen yet. Uh-huh. One of which being the Savage Land. Uh-huh. Don't tell me otherwise. I saw that and went, oh, we're going to get Kazar. Uh-huh. I'm here for this. Oh, my God. Give it to me. But we do see some different areas in the MCU. I even thought, too, and Pat, correct me if I'm wrong. Yeah. 2099 universe? It looked like it, yeah. I thought we saw that in there. It was kind of hard to keep track just because they were coming in such rapid fire mm-hmm. succession. Agreed. You know, but I I did, I do think I noticed that. There was also like a 90s or like early 2000s style universe. There was one where they were all made of paint. Which, yes. Which was funny and weird. It is, but it, like I said, it plays into the strengths of Doctor Strange. So then they finally crashed through to Earth. 838. Which looks like a nice, bright, shining utopia. Yeah, but it kind of had a different bizarro vibe to it. Yeah, uh, red light means go, green light means stop. Mm -hmm. And America Chavez gives the piece of advice, if you ever get lost in the multiverse, uh, get some food. 
Oh, we'll also find a bucket first because odds are you're going to throw up. Yep. And he goes, oh, no, I'll be fine. This isn't my first rodeo. Blah! And then he throws up. Yeah. But it's a cool sequence, though, when they get going on the street and you see that America Chavez ripped off the wrong food vendor. Uh-huh. Because, Pad, who was that food vendor? That was the one and only Bruce Campbell. Yes. Awesome to see him in here in his MCU debut. And it's kind of a cool sequence because Doctor Strange basically casts a little bit of a spell yeah. to buy him some time that he will just keep hitting himself. He'll just keep hitting himself. Uh, and America asks, how long is that spell going to last for? Uh, give or take three weeks. Mm-hmm. So as they're traveling through this earth, they come across where the his sanctum should be. Yep. And they find that it's a shrine. Because the one thing that gets brought up at this point is that, you know, she's been, she, uh, Strange asks her, how many multiverses have you been through? And she and she's like, well, uh, uh, counting this one, seventy two. Yeah. And she goes, and he she goes, well, you know, we need to find you. She goes, and he goes, well, why is that? He goes, she goes, because the one, one of the constants across all universes is that there's always a Doctor Strange. And then he get, and then it gets brought up either in that conversation or a later conversation. You know, oh well, what if we find another you? And she goes, well, that's the thing. I'm the I, in all the universes I've been to, there isn't another me. Yes. So it kind of plays into her little background. Do we get a little? insight into what she's all about and you do see the history about her two mothers are lost in time now too and she's basically been an orphan this entire time and and traveling trying to find a way back yep so you do understand the character of her and like i said gomez played her phenomenally oh it was incredible like for being this is her first mcu movie she fit in so perfectly yeah absolutely so as they're going through this they come across an old friend Asterix? Yeah. And it's the only Baron Mar- Mordo, uh-huh. who's played by Chitwell, Edge 04. Mm-hmm. And you see that he is there embracing Doctor Strange. Like, oh my God, I knew you'd be back. Well, and this is after they go to the Sanctum Sanctorium, Sanctorum, and there's the statue we saw in the one trailer, and we get the answer of why the hell there's a statue. Well, obviously, A, it's in another universe. Mm-hmm. But in this universe, uh, according to the uh, plaque on the statue, that Doctor Strange gave his life uh, fighting and defeating the one and only Thanos. Yes. So you do see they're catching up a little bit, and it's kind of a setup of what's going on because Mordo is just being so over-the-top friendly. You you know something's wrong. Right. Well, and, and even Strange at first is kind of nervous because America's like, well, well, who's this guy? He goes, and she gives, or he gives her a little bit of backstory. Like, oh, he's Baron Mordo. This is his story. And he hates my guts and wants to kill me. So he's almost got, like, his hands up ready to cast a spell, and he goes, ah, brother, it's happening. I knew this day would come. Yeah, so it's kind of a cool sequence as they're getting caught up in – Doctor Strange is trying to explain the events of what's going on. Oh, yes. and But Mortal's like, ah, oh, yes, I follow. I understand. Yeah, he's right there with him. But you know something's off this entire time. Mm-hmm. And as we come to find out, they've been drugged. Yeah, they were. he gave him tea because he's a good house guest. Yes. Or, uh, yeah, he's a good uh, house guest. Uh, and uh, they start going, oh, son, feels funny. Spiked their tea. Mm-hmm. So the guests are now drugged and knocked unconscious. Uh-huh. And then they're locked in... I forget what the element was. I don't think it's an actual element. I think it's just an element they made up, but it's not unobtainium, thank God. Mm-hmm. Uh, but they're locked in a, in a cage, and who do we run into? We run into the one and only Christine Palmer, mm-hmm. a.k.a. Ra- Rachel McAdams reprises her role in now the multiverse. But this is probably the most talked about sequence of events from this movie. Understandably so. And rightfully so, exactly. We find out that they are in... The Baxter Institute. Mm-hmm. And if you know that name from the comics, you know that's synonymous with one man, and that's Reed Richards. Mm-hmm. Big name Mr. Fantastic. But as you see, they are in there, and Doctor Strange is trying to plead his case to Christine, and she's explaining kind of the whole background of why you are in here. Well, she tells him, she's like, hey, listen, and, and it makes sense from a scientific oh, perfectly, stand- yeah. standpoint. You're from another universe. We don't know what you might be carrying or what you're infected with. You might have diseases here that we've not run into or something that could wipe out the entire population that we've not run into before. This is something we have to do. And if you watch any sci-fi over the years, you go, okay, no, that makes sense. No, perfectly made sense. No issues about this whatsoever. So they're both locked in their respective cells until Doctor Strange is removed because he has to go address a certain council. Uh Uh-huh. He's been summoned. He's been summoned. And this is probably the coolest moment of the film. And who escorts him to said meeting? Ultrons. Yes. So if anybody's going like, wait, what's going on here? Oh, man, oh, man, oh, man. Do we ever get the coolest moment Mm -hmm. of the film? Because we get introduced to everybody that is part of this universe's 
Illuminati. Uh huh. And we get a group that is some familiar faces. Yes. And one, I admit, I marked out for like a madman. I think the entire audience did, yeah. Well, that one, obviously, yeah, because we got confirmation. Yeah. But I had to do a double take because I was like, are you kidding me? Mm-hmm. We are actually going to acknowledge this character after one of the worst TV shows. It's the one flop Marvel's made. That, yeah, thus far. And we actually have a reappearance. Of the King Black Bolt mm-hmm. from the Inhumans, played by Anson Mount. I freaked out because, one, he was in a comic-accurate costume, which does not happen often. And he looked exactly like the King of the Inhumans, just sitting there, not saying a word, with the pitchfork right on his forehead. I geeked out. Oh, yeah. Now, granted, I am not the biggest in humans fan but i do like black bolt the man who a simple whisper can shatter a mountain literally yes and how he is king i mean it's a very interesting play of how he rules the inhumans the tv show did him no justice the tv show is just uh, if, if that was actually going to be the movie too hey. like i can't get down with that like i'm sorry they they do have potential even though when they're not forced down our throats to be x men light right there is some potential that they could actually be worthwhile characters and you know really get something out of them Mm -hmm. you know they they could have actually have some real relevance yeah but we get black bolt as the first character yep we see captain carter yep played by the one like Haley atwell oh amazingly amazingly reprising the role from what if yep so now she is a super soldier well maybe what maybe what if that's one of my gripes with the movie yeah which well, I mean, break it down for us. A they bit. never, they make it they, like obviously the assumption was it's Captain Carter from Marvel's What If show, because that's where we first saw her, and this appears to be the same character. They never make any mention or reference or like, hey, yes, this is the same person from the What If show, because let's face it, we're in a multiverse. It could be there could be multiple instances of that character across the multiverse. Mm-hmm. That's my one gripe is that like throughout the movie and they never make any reference to what happened in what if, and I'm not expecting like a breakdown blow by blow, you know, explanation of what happened, but just like something in there to acknowledge that like, yes, this is the person from the what if series, because none of the other team members of this Illuminati are a part or a part of that, that versions Avengers or whatever. Mm. You know? So is it the one from what if, I don't know. I don't know, but to be honest with you, I think that they had it so loaded up. That it didn't matter, like, it's just the assumption. Sure. Because, I obviously, I think that there were so many people outside the realm of time with this that you could kind of have that argument that she is the one from What If. I mean, so you can argue that with that one, but we'll get to one later that I don't think you can argue that for. True. I, I think I'm with you on the same one. We also have Captain Marvel, mm-hmm. but it's not the Captain Marvel we have seen before. No, it's Maria Rambeau. Yes. Reprising the role of Maria is Lashana Lynch. So very cool to see her back in the MCU. Yeah. Then we had the mic drop moment of mic drop moments because this is the one in our theater everybody erupted about. Uh-huh. And rightfully so, Reed Richards finally made his MCU debut. Uh-huh. And Pad, who played him? John Krasinski. Yes, the long-awaited fan casting finally came true. That's the moment I got spoiled on, by the way. Oh, that sucks, man. Uh-huh. I feel your pain because I had Luke Skywalker's return in Mandalorian spoiled for me. Yeah. So I, I'm with you on that. But it was very cool to see Krasinski play the role. And obviously, from what little we saw him in this film, yeah. pff, he's Reed Richards. Like, let's face Absolutely. It, there's no way that Marvel would screw around with the fans this badly. I'm sorry. There's just no way they're going to do that. Mm-hmm. If they do, I mean... I, I would be worried. It's, if they do, it's got to be a, a literal scheduling conflict. Yeah, but like I don't think that they would go to this length just to serve the fans without having. Uh, but I don't know. Like we're gonna find out this summer. Mark I, my I, words. I want it to be the case, but I also don't want to get my hopes up just to have them broken. Yeah, because I mean, Kevin Feige would just have to do a lot of explaining for that if it's not the case. But then we also have the other mic drop moment. <sighs> Where, Pat, I'll just let you take this one, the final member of the Illuminati. So they're talking, they're going back and forth, and you just hear a voice, and that's the one you heard from the trailer. Maybe we should tell him the truth. Mm -hmm. And it's the one and only Patrick Stewart reprising his role once again as Professor X, except this time he's in the yellow hover chair that we saw in the X-Men 
cartoon from the 90s. Also, as he comes on screen, thank you to whoever composed the score for this uh, this movie. They included the theme song from the 90s cartoon in the movie. He comes on screen and you just hear... I was losing my goddamn mind. And it, yeah, same here. It, it's Patrick Stewart back on screen again. Yes. So one of the coolest moments you'll ever see in screen. So the Illuminati had so many fan service characters... I was not mad about this. I'm like, okay, if this is all we get for this film, I'm good. Because, one, we got to read Richards. And like I said, I, I just can't see for the life of me them screwing around with the fans like that. But with Patrick Stewart, I think this is one and done for him, though. He's uh, actually said otherwise. He he's he realizes he's you know getting up there in age and he can't do it full time like he used to. He actually said in an interview he's willing to come back and play the character again, but the story has to be right. That's interesting. I know he made a, a comment, and so did Sir Eamon Cullen mm-hmm. about coming back. I, I just don't know if they're going to do that with the MCU, like I with the mutants, I should say. I don't know what direction they're going to go in with the X Men when they come back. I, I just see it being a full reset, almost like uh, X Men First Class, maybe. But we'll have to wait a little bit for that. And as Doctor Strange is sitting there, because Baron Mordo is with the Illuminati as well, he gets caught up to speed about his worlds or this yeah. worlds. Doctor Strange. Yeah, he's not exactly the hero that he's portrayed to be. Break it down, Pat. Uh, so, as the statue alluded to, and Strange brings up, they're like they're kind of gun shy about Strange the entire time because, like, they're well, we just can't trust you. Why can't you trust me? I'm, I, you know, I'm clearly a hero. Look at what your Doctor Strange did. And they're like, well, yeah, that's not entirely the case. But the statue says that he saved the world from Thanos. Yeah, well, he did help stop Thanos, but there was the whole matter of he had the dark hold went nuts, almost destroyed the entire world in doing so, uh, and we had to kill him before he got too powerful. Yeah. So what you told was a lie. He didn't actually stop to help Thanos. No, not really. He wasn't directly involved. No, he definitely wasn't, and they show Black Bolt killing him too. Uh huh. Which for anybody that wasn't worried about or was worried about his powers and like, why is he here? Boom. And given the Shawn Michaels Ric Flair moment, I'm sorry. Yeah. How damn cool is that? Oh, that was insane. I'm sorry. Like I say, this is why I wish they redid Inhumans, but not forced it down everybody's throat. Like, just keep Black Bolt. I don't need everybody else. I'm good. Well, maybe, nah, just give me Black Bolt. I'm good. Meanwhile, during this entire time, we do see that Wanda is staying busy in her own right. Oh, wait, she's not resting on her laurels, waiting patiently? I know, surprisingly not. We do see Wanda at Mount Wundagore now. Mm hmm. And basically is a throne for the Darkhold. Yeah, because while Strange has been in hopping through multiverses, uh, Wanda was trying to find a way to get to him, was in the process of dreamwalking, as they explain mm-hmm. it. And they explain that to be this process where you use magical mumbo jumbo to go into different universes, temporarily possess another version of yourself in that universe. And you can go through and you can basically do anything, you know, so she's doing that. But then the dark hole there gets destroyed and she's like, oh, bring it back. You know, there's got it's got to be in your head, blah, blah, blah. Uh, Wong tells her, well, that was a copy. And I, at first I'm thinking like, wait, there's another fucking book sitting yeah. around. And he goes, no, there, you know, it was transcribed from what was written on the walls in a, in a cave on a mountain. Well, where is it? It's on a mountain called Wondagore. Yeah. And that's when you and I sat up and went, oh, shit. Yeah, business just picked up. Uh-huh. Business so, just went there. So they go there, and she brings him, uh, she brings Wong with him, uh, or with her, excuse me. You know, and he's like, oh, nobody's ever gotten up there. You know, nobody, you know, uh, sorcerers aren't meant to set foot up there. And she basically goes, well, I'm the exception to the rule, and just starts flying up there. Yeah. So Wanda is all about her business and obviously using the dreamwalk technique to get to the 838 version of the mm-hmm. universe. She see Wanda is happily with her kids. Yeah. That were, you know, quote unquote killed off. Uh, we just define it as reasons. reasons. And we see that Wanda now possesses that version of the Scarlet Witch. Yep. And is on a mission to track down Doctor Strange and America Chavez. And we see as the Illuminati is catching Doctor Strange up to speed, Mm -hmm. that, yeah, your version caused an incursion. Yep. We had to do what we had to do. This is kind of, we're making the laws here. Yep. Wanda crashes the party. Uh Uh-huh. And does this in perfect horror movie style. God damn. 
She is killing everybody. Because Doctor Strange the entire time is trying to warn them. Like, no, like the, the entire time, the Illuminati is like, oh, don't worry. We can handle this. We're prepped for this. And Strange is like, no, you're not. She's a lot stronger than what you're used to. No, no, no. We got this. She shows up, wipes out their entire army of Ultron bots, mm-hmm. and then just starts wrecking house on, well, everyone. Yeah. So she goes through the Illuminati like nobody's business. Sews up Black Bull's mouth. Well, no, she doesn't sew it up. She dis- she makes it disappear. Or makes it disappear, it's, rather. It's gone. Yeah. So they, because they all show up, Captain Carter, Captain Marvel, Black Bolt, you know, uh, uh, Mr. Fantastic. I think the only ones not there are uh, Professor X and uh, Baron Mordo. Mm-hmm. So the other ones are down in the lobby, and they're basically like, oh, we have to stop you, blah, blah, blah. This is Black Bolt. You know, he can rip you to atoms with a single uh, word from his mouth. What mouth? And then the camera cuts back into Do- to Bl- uh, Black Bolt. He's got no mouth. He speaks a word, and the inside of his head explodes. Yeah. In such a badass way, too. I was like, okay, we are really going here. Uh-huh. And you see her just start tearing everybody apart. Mm-hmm. Taking out, you know, she Captain split, Carter. She takes out Captain Carter while what, she fights her, knocks her into a wall, and drops a statue on her, yeah. if I'm not mistaken. Reed Richards, she shreds into, like, pieces of string. Mm-hmm. Or so, or so. It's, it's almost like a, something out of Aladdin or something. Yep. And then his head explodes. Captain Carter gets sawed in half by her own shield. Yeah, that's how she went out. Holy yeah, shit. Yeah, Captain Marvel got taken up by the, the pillar. Yeah, pillar. Captain Carter got, so, you know, was throwing her shield around like cat, like someone with a shield does, but then it sawed her in fucking half. Yeah. Uh, and then Professor X came in uh, and was in Wanda's mind, and this is where we first got the glimpse of, okay, Wanda's not totally nuts. It's the Darkhold doing all this shit because there was this whole sequence in her head with, like, a cave, and, and Professor X is trying to save her. And boy, does Marvel have a thing for killing off Patrick Stewart in these movies. Yeah. It's the third time they've killed this man off uh, because from the inside of her own mind, goddamn, this is wild to say, while she's in another dimension, mind you, she snaps Professor X's head. Or yeah. Snaps his neck. Snaps his neck. Kills him from inside her own mind. Insane what sequence. The shit. But this is how creative they got with this film. Like I said, I, I fully applaud the writer, the writing crew on this. They went some different directions that if you were not sold on Wanda before this movie, you understand everything now. Well, and I got a big bring up a gripe I've had with some people that like they're like, why why did she become a villain all of a sudden? Dude, have you not been paying attention? She enslaved an entire town for a television during a television show just so she could get back the love of her life. Yeah. That's not exactly something an upstanding hero in Avenger does. The problem with her is she is so traumatized by the actions that have been around her mm-hmm. that, yeah, I mean, she's unfortunately broken. And she's broken, and at the start of the show, it looks like it's peaceful and innocent all enough. Mm-hmm. But the more you go on, the more you get the layers of the onion peel back and how dark and twisted it is, you know, where you've literally got people crying and weeping, you know, at you know, uh, Vision and Monica Rambeau and all these other people who are, like, aware of what's going on. Like, Help us get us the fuck out of here. Yeah. We don't want this. Like, you're sitting there going, oh, it's such a sudden turn. Have you not been paying attention? This has been her character the entire time in comics, to be honest with you. You can go back through her lineage. Sure. I mean, not just even saying House of M, which everybody remembers what she did there. And that's probably the most notable mm-hmm. uh, incident yeah. of her powers. But there's been times throughout the comics or the Avengers run that we've seen this. Like, Wanda is just, unfortunately, somebody that is so damaged from the events in her life that it's very tough to, you know, have her be completely heroic because what she does is she's trying to do what she feels is right. Right. And it's kind of like, in a weird sense, much like Magneto, her father. Right. Because... They feel what they're doing is right for them and right for their cause they believe in. And with Wanda, we've seen her do everything to restore love and balance in her life because as she put to the line with Doctor Strange, you go back in time, you fix things, everybody says you're a hero. And I hate to say it, as much as I was on Team Cap in Civil War, Iron Man might have been right about Wanda. (sighs) It's tough. Because remember why he locked her up in in Civil War? Like, this is what happened on a small scale. If your powers get out of control... We don't know what could happen. It's always a great debate. And like I said, shout out to JVD from Crossover Collision. I know he put that out online too. It 
it's just all on what Wanda does in that moment. Right. And that's the thing with her. Like, she's so unpredictable with her powers. Mm -hmm. Like, I fully think that she was camouflaging herself from everybody and kind of given that aura that everything is fine, don't worry. I think it was, I don't necessarily think it was that case. I think it was a case of, it's like, live and let live. We don't fuck with you. You don't fuck with us. Yeah. Even if it had to sacrifice a small town. Yeah. I mean, I think at this stage, they, they've already gone through half the universe disappearing. So they're like, kind of like, well, we don't want to have part two. Yeah. Because we can't pull that off again. I digress. So during this whole thing, you see Wanda tearing through everybody, almost getting to America Chavez. Yep. You do see Christine Palmer making a stop with mm-hmm. a weapon to buy him some time. They do make an escape. Yep. And they're now into like that space in between. Yep. Th- different dimensions yep going for the book of the vishanti which is the opposite of the dark hold yeah it's like the the yin to the yang yes exactly like this is something you know from dr strange it's one of the most powerful weapons in the entire marvel universe Mm -hmm. and you do see that it appears that wanda obviously gets in there and takes it out yep which now is going to be a bigger problem Mm -hmm. and then when she makes the play on america chavez she forces her to open up another portal, sending Doctor Strange into a wasteland. Uh-huh. Like basically, what happened in the eight three eight universe is the incursion, just completely the aftermath. Right, and didn't they say something to the effect of like that universe or that reality collapsed in on itself, or like mm-hmm. it, or it collided with another one, or something to that effect? Yeah, yeah. So it's definitely a wild sequence as he goes to catch up with his universe in this universe. Mm-hmm. The Doctor Strange there. Yep. So you do see this is where he runs into the alleged what if Doctor Strange. And and this is my gripe. Like in the trailer, we we saw the line where Doctor Strange goes, oh, now things just got out of hand. And it very clearly looked like the Strange we saw from what if. Mm-hmm. Fast forward to this movie and what we actually see, I don't think it was because you had that Strange who was a megalomaniac willing and ready to run through multiple dimensions to just get whatever the hell he wanted. Mm -hmm. And this dude's almost like apologetic and feels like shit for what he did. I don't think it's the same one. It's debatable. No, I mean, that's a great point, Pat. Like, it's something that I think maybe they should have cleared up, but I just kind of rolled with it at, at this point because we've seen so many characters pop in and out. That it's like, all right, let's just see where how this story plays out. And it might have had something to do with the fact that the 838 Christine Palmer went with Doctor Strange. Right. Our Doctor Strange. Right. So as they go there, they wind up getting a hold of the of that universe's dark hole. Right. After a crazy sequence, which you will never be able to look at music notes the same way again. No, that's that's for sure. So our Doctor Strange taps into that universe's dark hold. It's comics, folks, just roll with it. And now he goes to dreamwalk himself back to the 616. Because what we failed to mention is the dead Doctor Strange at the beginning of the movie, the one that was killed by the octopus. Came through, the, came through the portal. Came through in the portal. They buried him on a rooftop. Uh-huh. Well, Doctor Strange decided to tap into the undead. Well, yeah, because he brings up, uh, or uh, what is it, uh, Rachel McAdams brings up a well, wait. To dreamwalk, you need somebody, you know, one of your other selves on the other side. And he said, who has said it has to be someone living? Yeah. So it is a crazy thing to see as he now activates the undead. Zombie strange. Yeah, like we just This needs to be a Funko Pop, please. Yeah. And this is where, I mean, America Chavez is right there at Wanda's disposal on Wendigore. And you see that there is now a battle... Mm-hmm. With Zombie Strange coming in to save the day. Yep. And just how insane this gets. Well, and Wong, who we thought died earlier in the movie because he got thrown off a fucking cliff. Yeah, he got his ass kicked this entire film. Uh, was out for most of the film. Uh, come to find out, he has been unconscious on a cliffside, maybe about a quarter of the way down the mountain. Makes his way back up for the fight. Sees Zombie Strange in the middle of the fight and go and just looks at him and goes, I don't want even want I don't even want to know. Nope. He's like, I've seen enough weird shit today. I'm good. So the during the zombie fight. Wong is talking to America Chavez, too, a little bit, and so is Strange. Yeah. And Dead Strange is kind of saying, listen, you can use your powers. Listen, I understand your parents went away. Listen, now is the time you can tap into it. Conquer your fear. The world is depending on you. The universe is depending on you. You're down by one touchdown. We need a score to win the championship. You know, this is the motivational speech. You have one shot. One opportunity. You're going to take it or let it slip. And America Chavez kicks it in, gets the confidence. Uh Uh-huh. Transporting Wanda... To the 838, mm-hmm. 
where now she's seeing her kids with the other Wanda. Yep, who remembers what the, or has an idea what the hell happened. Yeah, and gets a cold dose of reality that I'm the bad guy. Because the entire time they've been trying to tell her, like, listen, you think this is going to go the way you think it does, but it might not necessarily go. They might not accept you. You know, how do you know they're just going to let you walk in and take the place of their mother? No, it's fine. I'm their mother. It'll work perfectly fine. And she shows up all happy, hungry, admittedly a little bloody and a little dirty and a little messy. Mm -hmm. But she shows up, oh, kids, I'm so happy to see you. And they're like, oh, my God, no, get away from us. Yeah, exactly. So after this rejection, she goes back. And, t- and starts destroying Wonder Gore and everything that is the Darkhold. Mm-hmm. Presumably bringing the entire mountain down upon herself. Uh-huh. I have a theory, though. Well, she ain't dead, I can tell you that much. Oh, I, I, no, she's not dead. Like, let's comic, face it. Comic reasons. Is there a body? It's called the Jean Grey rule. Well, yeah. Okay, mutants yeah. don't die. Yeah. And especially if you read X-Men comics right now, they don't die ever. Yeah. This is a situation I think that she switched bodies with the 838. Well, I also think it's the, uh, she doesn't have, there's no bot. We didn't see a body there. There was mm-hmm. no arm falling out of the rubble and, and, you know, in that kind of like final way. We just saw the mountain explode and like a red light supposed to be her powers go off. Mm-hmm. There was no, there was no body. You, you know, even with movies, Darth Maul got sliced in half. He still came back. I still, if there was a body, I still wouldn't believe she's dead. No, I don't believe it either. And I, I guarantee you she's not dead. So now that she's, been defeated we'll just word it as that because let's face it it ain't gonna happen everybody goes back to their normal lives per se so to speak you see that america chavez is now training with wong at camartage and you know the rebuilding process is happening there yeah dr strange has kind of come to a piece where he's now happy with everything going on even though christine palmer is now married to somebody else awkward and as he's walking on the streets well something happens Mm mm-hmm Dad, what happens? Uh, he gets a little bit of a headache. He's walking down the street. He's in his street clothes. You know, he's kind of blended in. Maybe he's going to get some shawarma. Uh, but then he gets a little, he's going across the street. I think he steps one foot off the sidewalk and in, into the crosswalk. Uh, and then he goes, ah, you know, he gets a headache. He starts grabbing at his head. Camera kind of swings around a little bit. And then it stops on his head. And he pulls his hands back from his face. And there's a third eye popping into his forehead. Yes. And movie. Uh-huh. But... We get a very, very cool bonus scene here Mm -hmm. because they just kind of leave it like he's now had this extra eye because he's tampered with the Darkhold. He did the weird thing with the corpse. Yep. So he has dark magic running through his veins. Uh Uh-huh. So let's just clarify that. Yep. He doesn't have the fingers turning uh, charcoal either. And they did ask that. It did get brought up, but he showed his fingers. He was perfectly good. Yeah. So... They are camouflaging that very well. So my theory is the Darkhold is still in him, obviously, yep. in some capacity. Uh huh. But as they kind of progress to like the next day from the sequence, yep. he runs into a character that if you read Doctor Strange or you're reading Marvel right now is a very, very important character. Well, yeah, he's walking down the street. You see the fabric of reality rip open. Uh, it's like a purplish looking slash, you know, comes out through the, literally the middle of the damn sidewalk mm-hmm. uh, and out star out steps one and only Charlize Theron playing who? Clea. Uh-huh. The mistress of the dark dimension, who is a long time Doctor Strange character and currently is the Sorceress Supreme in the comics. Mm-hmm. So if you're not familiar, get familiar. This is a big move in the comics and especially... Seeing Charlize Theron join the MCU is huge enough to begin with. But let alone, this is a big role for her, and this is how we're going to go into this, the trilogy of Doctor Strange. Yeah, because she comes out of the portal, looks at him, and goes, Hey, you caused an incursion. You need to help me put a stop to it. You down? And he goes, ready and willing. Yeah, and you see the eye pop, too. You see the eye pop up, and they go into the dark dimension. Yes. So I am super excited about that. I mean... To see her, because I did not hear anything about this coming. No, this is one that stayed very well under wraps. Yeah, which kudos to them for doing as well, because I did not think that that was going to happen. And sure enough, here we are. Well, then we get the second post credit scene, which is equally funny, uh, where it's Bruce Campbell on the street and the spells finally wore off. And he's like, oh, thank God, it's over. Cut to black. Yeah. It's it's crazy. I mean, that's how they had to end it. Sam Raimi did an amazing job with this. Oh, yeah. I will say I really enjoyed this film. I did too. You know, I'm not going to crown it the greatest MCU film of all no. time. It was entertaining. It broke the the cookie cutter mold. Oh, it definitely did. 
I need more like this. I there, don't... there were still kind of those comedic moments that you're used to with the Marvel movies. You sure. know, when Strange goes to bury the zombie body or the de- uh, the dead Strange body on the rooftop in New York. You know, Wong looks at him and goes, that's got to break a few codes. And, and Strange goes, listen, I've buried a lot worse up here. Exactly. And no, it's like, oh, huh, okay. No, they played it very well. And I thought Sam Raimi's vision really translated well with Doctor yeah, Strange. Like, yeah. really. I think the only one who could done uh, maybe a, a even more crazier version would have been James Gunn. Yeah. Just because you get real crazy yeah. with with how they go off into different directions. But it's nothing bad about the performance about it. Like I say, everything you had in this movie lived up to the fan hype that you were desperately waiting for. You had the Illuminati moment, which everybody was talking about. I know we didn't see Tom Cruise. Listen, that was brought up by the the writer did get asked about that. Yeah. And he did see a article about you know, at one point, I guess Tom Cruise was considered to play Iron Man in a movie in the '90s. In the '90s, yep. So he saw that and he thought it would be fun, and he did bring it to Kevin Feige, and he did run it by Kevin Feige just to see if they could do a cameo. Mm-hmm. And it sounded like it wasn't. It wasn't. They weren't able to do it because at the time they were filming this, Cruise was filming part one of his next uh, Mission Impossible movie. Yeah. So it was it was a scheduling conflict. He did bring it. He did say in an interview he did bring it and run it by Kevin Feige. But it sounds like the offer never made it to Tom Cruise because he was overseas filming uh, Mission Impossible. He could have been, but like though, that's one thing too. If you're not familiar with the '90s MCU, and I know that everybody's going, wait, there was a movie universe. Tom Cruise was attached to the role of Iron Man for years, mm-hmm. like. <sighs> almost 10 i want to say like sure it was a while like when they were started talking about doing a movie with him and it just never came to fruition right and then obviously that was like with james cameron was tagged with spider-man for right. i don't know how many right. years that there's all these little sub castings that they were talking about doing that just never came to fruition i think charlie sheen was tagged at one yeah, point yeah i to, think so um you know for being somebody so to see that kind of nod it would have been a, a fun thing for anybody that's really stayed with this the entire time right but it's not exactly like deal breaking that it right. happened but the fact that they tied in just enough yeah they gave great fan service with like i said patrick stewart yeah john krasinski which yeah. I'm, I'm standing on my i'm standing on my soapbox screaming that's your doc that's your reed richards and i i think you're right and as to why i think you're right like i said we'll get to that in one shots mm-hmm, absolutely i i will deep dive into that in one shots i think this film gave fans a different look at the mcu through a horror director's eyes mm-hmm. it played off very well the fact that they have now introduced clea as the mistress of the dark dimension as mm-hmm. she is in the comics who who has a long history with Doctor Strange. Yeah. Is a great nod to the comics. And ultimately what's going to happen for the third one is going to get weird. Oh, yeah. Because obviously you're talking about the Dark Dimension. A lot of characters are going to maybe get brought into it. You're not going to see the big Illuminati-esque right, castings right. here. Right. But you're going to see enough that if you're a Doctor Strange reader, I think you're going to be really happy. Sure. If you're not, you might be a little puzzled at first, but you're finally going to get the big battle between him and Mordo. Like, that's coming, this next film. We thought it'd be in this movie, but hey, detour. No, they only kind of tease it a little bit, uh, what happened in the Illuminati temple. Right. Or Baxter building. Like, wherever, yeah, yeah, yeah. wherever that room was. Like, because there was kind of like a little skirmish. There was a, but it wasn't our Baron Mordo. Yeah, but it's not even right home about it. It was just kind of like, mm, all right. We just kind of had Mordo in this film just to have him. Which is fine, because yeah. like I said, he's going to play a bigger role in the third, so I'm not even concerned about this. But they did so much cool throwbacks. Like I said, seeing Anson Mount return as Inhuman, yeah, uh, Black Bolt, I yeah. freaked out. Because I'm like, anything is possible to see him come back. And like yeah. I say, if they just want to keep him, I'm good. We don't need every Inhuman coming back. At least in small doses. Like, I, I just don't want to see them back on the, on the screen anytime soon. But it tied into the Illuminati. Cool cameos from former faces of the MCU. This movie had a lot for everybody, and I think that that's why it's such a big hit. And I think it can show Marvel that you can go in some different directions and the audience will still show up. I mean, sure, it's the MCU. It's the brand. Yeah. But this film had a different vibe to it. And you know I am a big proponent. Give me something new. This film did. Was it something that I'm definitely going to go back and see? Absolutely. Am I saying, though, it's in my top five? Eh, in the lower half, maybe. Yeah. I don't. I'm. I. I'm not ready to crown it above Winter Soldier yet. No. I'm not ready to crown it above Infinity War yet. No. But I will say this: I definitely want to do a rewatch, and I definitely have a lot of good things to take home about it. And I think for the MCU fans, 
it's going to be a good year kicking off with Doctor Strange in the Multiverse of Madness. Because mm-hmm. next up we got Thor: Love and Thunder. Yep, you got uh, Ms. Marvel coming out in less than a month now. Mm-hmm. Yeah, the, I know the teaser trailer just dropped again. So June eighth, I believe that's dropping. Something like that. Yeah, it's going to be a big year for the MCU. But now it's officially feeling like the MCU. Nothing against Moon Knight and the other Disney Plus shows. But let's face it. It's something about going to a movie theater and seeing the MCU on the big screen that you just can't describe. That being said, we gave you our take of Doctor Strange in the Multiverse of Madness. Now we want to hear yours, ODPH Society. Hit us up on that hashtag, hashtag ODPHpod. Did you see the movie yet? What did you love? What did you not? The embargo is lifted. Let's talk about the film, shall we? We're going to take a quick break. We'll be right back. Hello everyone, my name is Nick. I'm the host of Nikolai's Kitchen and I'm also the host of the annual live stream for The Cure. Livestream for the Cure is a charity event where we raise money with content creators and podcast partners from around the world for the Cancer Research Institute, a wonderful nonprofit researching cancer immunotherapy, training the body's immune system to fight all forms of cancer. This is a mission and a future that I truly believe in. And myself and my team worked tirelessly over the past five years to raise over $50,000 for this cause. This year, we're aiming for our biggest single goal to date of $20,000, and we cannot do it without your help. Please join us for the event May 19th through the 21st, starting at 9 a.m. Eastern, for 45 hours of content from people all over the world. Together, we can bring hope for a future immune to cancer. The more eyes we reach, the more dollars we raise. Please help us in making this goal a reality. Together, we can make a difference. Coming back for another segment on this edition of the ODPH Podcast, and it's Fear the Walking Dead talk time. Uh Uh-oh. Let us break it down. I know there has been kind of some mixed reaction from yours truly about this season, and obviously there's been a lot to be desired in certain aspects because it's all building towards the battle between Strand and Morgan, the two strongest characters on this show. And this season, they've been kind of like tiptoeing around a little bit. Mm -hmm. They've been giving you a little bit since they've returned from mid-season break. But it's all going to, you know, really start picking up some steam now. And this episode, we finally had the real return of Victor Strand, played by Coleman Domingo. Because when he's not on the show, it's just it loses a a dynamic to me. There's something about it. Because when you get him and you get Morgan Jones on the show, played by the one only Lenny James... They really just shine, and they really like amp up everything. Mm. And I know the Strand hasn't been on there for a couple episodes because they've been doing a page out of the the actual Walking Dead show. Yeah, where we have so many characters, we're dancing around. We gotta give everybody equal time because they're just trying to basically explain how everybody is going to take their stance against Strand for the Tower. The only thing left standing from the nuclear blast that went off in this part of the Walking Dead universe, and now the stakes have never been higher. You have Alicia back, who's now teaming up with Morgan. They're ready to make the play. There's been some back and forth about who's working with who, and we finally now have an episode where it's been their best since they've returned. I will say that right now. This has been a good episode to really kind of sink your teeth into, so I want to start deep diving in about episode 12 entitled Sunny Boy. So, you know the deal by now. Spoiler-free reaction. Very good episode. Not super keen on the ending part of the show. Okay. I will get into that, but I thought for where we've been since we've returned, this really started feeling like, okay, we're here now. Let's go. The drama really picked up, and I thought they had a couple really strong performances. All right, so let's get into that spoiler talk, shall we? So in three, two, one, we finally killed off some people that mattered. Okay. So in very, very unique ways, but also there's one faux pas pad. And I know that you being a Walking Dead aficionado can fully understand the anger of this moment when it comes. All right. Because what is going on here is Strand, who is absolutely paranoid as the dictator of the tower. And is now on a mission to find all these traitors in his building. 
because obviously we had the Romeo and Juliet throwaway story. Yep. Not going to sugarcoat it. I'm sorry. It was a throwaway story. Yeah. But now oh, there's a traitor running through the building. Who else is with them? We need to find out. And now it kind of got heightened a little bit because the baby that Morgan and Grace had been watching that uh, the deal was broken and that Grace and the baby could stay at the tower and be safe mm-hmm. as long as Morgan stayed away. Well, that baby is now gone. Mm. And Strand is freaking out now, thinking Morgan got in there. You see his paranoia running wild. Like this is one of Coleman Domingo's str- like strongest performances, I yeah. think, in the show. Because when he gets to really ham it up a little bit, this really escalates everything. So now, as he's sending everybody through, they're finding all these walkie-talkies through the tower. Like people are hiding under their beds, right? Hiding in desks. And of course, what do you think they're doing when they're finding him, Pat? Uh, nothing good. Chucking them off the roof. So you're seeing all these bodies going flying. Makes sense. Until one is discovered. And this is where the episode got very, very interesting. All right. Because you see that Howard, played by Omad Abatari. Mm -hmm. Apologize if I messed the name up. The guy who has been with Strand since day one in the tower. Had a walkie-talkie on him. Oh, interesting. And this is somebody that, one, I couldn't believe had a walkie-talkie. Two, was immediately denying he had a walkie-talkie. And three, Strand has now gotten so paranoid, he actually questioned the loyalty. And then we find out a little backstory about Howard. Because Howard is confiding in John Dory Sr., who has now kind of asserted himself into the upper echelon of the Strand hierarchy shall yeah, we say yeah keith carradine obviously plays an amazing john dory senior so seeing him get some more screen time i'm all in for and as they're trying to investigate what happens you find out a little bit more about howard's background and how his family took off before the apocalypse and him giving the tower to strand was the way of hopefully bringing them back and this is like he's never had a a, a wavering thought against him and he's been framed and he can't figure out what happens so meanwhile john senior is using his detective skills, being a former officer, to figure out, okay, where's the baby? And it has to really go through the tower. And he does find out his suspicions were right, and there's one person that he knows took the baby. Mm -hmm. And that's June, played by Jen Elfman. Okay. Because, obviously, with uh, Strand making the order about killing the uh, Romeo of of the young couple, yeah, and then now the girl is radiation poisoned to death, and she's just dying a slow, painful existence now, she has really changed her tune about her loyalty to Strand and really wants to say, you know what, I'm going to go with Team Morgan, and I'm going to help them out. But where they find him is in the bottom of the tower because what June is trying to do, and tell me if this makes any sense to you, as a logical move, you're trying to escape through the sewer system. Okay. You have a fence there that is blocking you from escaping. Sure, like a t- like you're going down a tunnel and there's a fence stopping you. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. On the other side of it is nothing but zombies. Yeah. So she's trying to go down there every day and like stab them in the head so she can escape out there. I mean, I understand the train of thought, but it's fighting a losing battle. Exactly. So when this happens, John gets down there and sees like, okay, you're trying to get out through these underground tunnels. This is not going to work. And if you really want to get it out, I can find a way to do this. And John shows that he now has some radiation poisoning as well. Mm. So everybody is now getting infected from the, the fallout of this blast. It's usually how it goes. Exactly. So he knows that he's on borrowed time. And he's basically said, I'm going to live to stop Strand, and I will help you get out of here. Because, I mean, obviously that's his former daughter-in-law. Right. So he's got to do what he's got to do. During this melee, though, if it's raining pretty hard down in these uh, sewer-esque tunnels, Pad, what do you think happens? Uh, Nothing good. The waters shove all the zombies right through the fence. Oh, of course. So now they're running around this little basement. Sorry, sorry, I flushed the toilet. My fault. Yeah, exactly. His gun is now lost in the water. He has to go find it. He's now shooting at these zombies, and basically they have to pull themselves into a little cubbyhole where there's a phone to call up right. for help. And she's going, what am I going to do? Like, what am I going to do? Like, And he says, you have to call for help. Yeah. Like, if you can't, 
I'm sorry. You're going to die anyway. So it doesn't matter. Call and get Strand down here to save you. Sure enough, they call. We fucked up. We fucked up. Yeah. We fucked up. So Strand comes down there, finds the baby is is hidden in a in a cavern or er, a cavern down there, and is going like, okay, what the hell happened here? And Howard has been sitting there the entire time because he was given an ultimatum, like, find the baby, otherwise I'm going to throw you off the roof because I don't trust you. John Dory Sr. fesses up. Yeah, I planted the thing on Howard because I want to work with you. Right. I want to be your right hand. Well, Strand, how do you think he reacts to this? Uh, Not well. <laughs> he applauds it. Ooh. He goes, oh, that takes a little bit of moxie. So we go up to the roof. Oh, boy. And Strand is sitting there, and Howard is, like, watching this go by and going, like, what the hell is going on? Yeah. I pledge my allegiance to you. I'm, you're going to help me get my family back. Right. What are we doing here? So they get on the rooftop, and Strand goes, well, John, if you want to be my right hand, throw Howard off the roof. Bum, bum, bum. And during this, you just see Dory's like, no, I can't do this. And he's like, no, if you're going to be my right hand, you need to do this. And... John Dory does something unheard of. Oh, he throws him off the roof. All right. So Howard is actually killed off. And then Strand gives the bombshell of bombshells. Well, his family's been dead for months. Nice. Doesn't matter. And like he's like, you knew about this? He goes, oh, yeah, I knew his family's been dead, long dead. But you know what? I needed to use the tower for my vision. So you know what? It works out in the end. So John is sitting there going like, all right, I, I, uh, th- my plan is not going to work because he thinks he can be the right hand and talk to Strand and, and be the guiding force to end this peacefully. Mm-hmm. No, it doesn't. They go into Strand's office, and then this is the question I'm going to ask you. Uh-huh. John Dory, dying of radiation poisoning, has Strand not paying attention. Yep. He knocks him out. Okay. If you're in the Walking Dead universe... Mm-hmm. And you're taking out the quote unquote big bad. Uh huh. You knock them out. Yep. What do you do then? Kill him in the head. Exactly. And what do you think John does? Not kill him in the head. Nope. He makes a run with the baby. I'm going, like, I'm sitting there watching this episode and I'm going, are you kidding me? Oh, you reap what you sow. Yeah, I'm like, how, how do you not do this? This is just. Dumb as dumb can be. You have the perfect opportunity to kill Strand. End game. Raise the banners. You win the chip. The tower is yours. No. You knock him out because they're in the his like shrine of museums. Because you got to remember in this tower, it's a former museum in, in some aspects. There's all these artifacts and such that Howard had been saving up. Mm-hmm. John makes this like... Weird Iron Man esque suit to escape. Yeah, like, it's like uh, old old medieval knight armor. He's got like a lacrosse mask on. Like yeah. it's Walking Dead, so you like yeah, I understand yeah, yeah. why. Yeah, and basically he's just saying, "Well, I'm going to escape with the baby and get it to Morgan, who's on the outside. Who Morgan's like waiting for the tower, like the signal to come down, and he's got his forces ready to roll." So during this, Strand is knocked out, and then he's found by Wes who was with the group at one point and his brother was part of the doomsday cult. And then he defected last week because the whole thing with Luciana and and that whole episode, which was a very good episode too. I know we didn't do a full deep dive about it last week, but it was a, it was a good episode though. Nevertheless, this is now he is going to start taking over the role here. He finds strand. He's like, listen, we got to go after John. They get to the rooftop and they're doing this whole thing where they're building another radio antenna on the roof which is a little crazy. At this point, they're watching John go through the sea of walkers. Now, Pad, Mm -hmm. if you're not covered in zombie blood and you're just walking through a random herd, how easy are you detected? Uh, Pretty damn easily. Yeah. So what do you think happens? He's got the kid underneath the armor as he's walking through the zombie herd and he's getting mauled. Yeah. Yeah. Which I'm like, are you kidding me this entire damn time? You had the perfect chance to take Strand out. You're on this mission to get Morgan the child, which is noble. I'm not knocking that. But you're now getting mauled by a zombie herd to escape. Mm -hmm. So now he has basically sacrificed himself to get Morgan the child by Morgan 
a, a chance to escape to because Strand's on the rooftop with his own army. Right. And basically, Strand is just sitting up top there going, okay, I'm going to give you this last message, Morgan. If I ever see you again, I'm shooting you on sight. Mm. And anybody that comes with you is dead too. You're never going to see them again. And now I have your hostages here too. So if I see them or if I see you again too, I'm killing everybody. Drop Mike. Have a nice day. And then you see that there's an opening for the new right hand. And who jumps in there? Wes. And that's how the episode ends. Oh, boy. So it was good in a lot better episode than it was. I'm sad to see Keith Carradine leave the show. But listen, it makes sense in the storyline. Except just the randomness you could have taken Strand out. Don't understand that logic. In this, in this universe of The Walking Dead, that was the end game. Stop Strand. You had the perfect shot. And you let it slip. Only thing I'll say bad about the episode, otherwise I think it's been their best one since they have returned from mid-season break. Easily, hands down. That is my take on it. Definitely something to build on to going into the last half of this season because I believe there's only four more episodes left. But we got to get there first into the big battle, which I know is coming. They're doing a little more hype for it. Mm -hmm. So excited to see what's going to happen next week. But until then, hit me up on the hashtag, hashtag ODPHpod. What is your thoughts about Fear the Walking Dead, episode 12 entitled Sunny Boy? Let me know what you think. Are you watching the show? If not, definitely tell me why you're not. If you're into the Walking Dead universe, you should definitely check it out. It's one of the better written shows on the AMC network by far. That's our take. So hit us up. Let us know. We'll take a quick break. We'll be right back. This is Tom from Tom Joe Lou. This is Matt from Sideroom Sounds. And you're listening to ODPH Podcast. Wanna go where no one knows my name To the desert, the oceans, or the plains Cause I wanna... Coming back for the final segment on this edition of the ODPH Podcast. Pad, what you got? Got a couple things to talk about. Uh, the first of which is some Star Wars news because it was announced by the folks over at the Disney Plus Twitter account that the Ahsoka television series is officially under production. Hey! Uh, they tweeted this out back on May 9th at noon. Uh, a photo, uh, which I'll describe in just a minute, but the tweet reads, quote, Ahsoka, an original series, starts production today. Hashtag Disney Plus. And in the photo, we see a chair where it's, it's got a logo that says Ahsoka on it. And then there's a familiar hat on said chair. And if you're familiar with said hat, you know who that hat belongs to. It is the one. It is the only Dave Filoni. I guess we've heard of him here. Oh, a couple times. so excited! So clearly, I'm Filoni, who has had probably the biggest hand in Ahsoka's whole story, uh, more so than maybe George Lucas himself. I don't know. Uh, it's debatable. A, it's debatable. Uh, you know, but Filoni, who obviously was the director and producer of uh, Clone Wars, which was Ahsoka's introduction, and then obviously when she appeared on Rebels. Uh, and then, obviously, she appeared on Mandalorian, and then for a brief stint on Book of Boba Fett. Filo- Dave Filoni is very invested and very much uh, a, a, a big hand in ushering her story forward. He cares a lot about the character, so it only makes sense that he'd be involved with this in some capacity. He's not, sh- I don't think he's showrunner, but he's probably directing a fair number of episodes. I would at, say at he's, a guess. he's heavily involved, we'll just put it that uh-huh. way. So, uh, super excited for this whenever it decides to drop. No word about story or anything like that, or there's no trailer, because, hey, literally just started filming we'll see yeah we gotta get to kenobi first so this is true but what a follow-up though yeah uh sticking with some uh, streaming news it was announced uh via the folks over at deadline that the amazon prime show starring john krasinski uh jack ryan is going to end with season four and that a spinoff headlined by michael penna is being eyed by amazon funny they have season three hasn't even come out yet jesus hmm. christ uh, so the head article from Deadline reads, quote, uh, Tom Clancy's Jack Ryan, starring and executive produced by John Krasinski, has an end date in sight, I hear. Season four of the Prime Video Action Series, which is currently filming, will be its last, sources tell Deadline. But that may not be the end of the franchise, produced by Amazon Studios, Paramount TV Studios, and Skydance TV. I hear a potential spinoff series headlined by Michael Pena as another character from Clancy's Jack Ryan literary universe, Ding Chavez, is in development. Uh, Jack Ryan's end and potential spinoff are both a ways off as Prime Video has not set, uh, not set a season three premiere date yet, so fans will have to get two more seasons of the Mothership series before it calls it a day, likely in 2023. Uh, no one is commenting, but according to sources, Krasinski had committed to four seasons of Jack Ryan when he signed on to take on the famous role previously played by Alec Baldwin, Harrison Ford, Ben Affleck, and Chris Pine. 
In addition to starring and exec producing, Krasinski has been helping to steer the series in a writing showrunner type capacity during the latter part of its run. Pena will be introduced in the final episode of the upcoming third season before joining the cast full-time in season four. Amazon announced Pena's addition to the cast in the season four pickup announcement in October without revealing his character. Uh, so it looks like season four is going to be the end of uh, Jack Ryan, which is fine. Season one was, was great. Season two, a little bit of a step so, down. So, so, so it wasn't as good as season one, but it was still good. Uh, don't want to necessarily run it out before it's kind of when it, and run it into the ground. So it makes sense and understand. Well, if you've seen certain things and you know certain things, you might know why uh, Krasinski might not be able to do more of Jack Ryan, and I'll just leave it at that. I think it's fantastic news that he's deciding to go out on a good note. Yeah. Fantastic. Yeah. So we'll have to wait and see about that. Uh, switching over to some movie news because I am very excited about this. It was announced over on Crunchyroll that they are officially bringing a Toei Animation's brand new Dragon Ball Super superhero film to theaters across the world. Ooh. Super excited for this. So reading from Crunchyroll's own article on their own site, uh, it reads, quote, Crunchyroll is officially bringing Toei Animation's brand new Dragon Ball Super superhero film to theaters across the world this summer. The latest Dragon Ball Super uh, movie will be released across the globe in both subtitled and dubbed formats in North America, Latin America, Europe, Australia and New Zealand, Africa, the Middle East, and Asia, excluding Japan. Uh, exact premiere dates, additional cast announcements, and ticket purchase information will be announced at a later date, so stay tuned to Crunchyroll News for the latest. In the meantime, catch up on the hit Dragon Ball Super anime series, uh, which you can watch on Crunchyroll. Uh, you can also watch the brand new trailer with English subtitles, uh, which they have uploaded to their YouTube channel. Uh, I am super excited for this because this is, of course, the latest entry in the Dragon Ball franchise. Mm -hmm. It is written uh, by series creator Akira Toriyama, uh, and it appears we're going to get the return of the Red Ribbon Army. If you are a longtime Dragon Ooh. Ball fan, you know who that is. If you've seen the original Dragon Ball uh, series, you know who that is. So the return of the Red Ribbon Army is going to be awesome to see. I am super excited for this movie. Uh, it has been quite a while since we've had anything new Dragon Ball. Obviously, the manga is still going mm -hmm. on. I don't count that other TV show that's going on. Not canon. But in terms of, like, actual animation, the last thing we saw was the Dragon Ball Super Broly movie, which came out in 2018. So it's been a minute. So I'm, I'm excited for this. It's been a hot minute, but the audience is waiting for it, so it's a smart move to do. Absolutely. Uh, and then over to some other uh, TV news. We did get a trailer uh, drop last week for the upcoming Game of Thrones prequel spinoff, whatever you want to call it, uh, series House of Dragon. And I got to say, looks good. Yeah, it definitely surprised me. I yeah. I am on the fence about this because I still have the bad taste in my mouth from Game of Thrones. Ending. Understandable. But this actually looked good. I, I'm not going to lie. Like, visually, it looks very impressive. Yeah. Storyline, let's kind of see when we get into it. But yeah, we'll see. But for first impressions, I thought it was actually very yeah, good. Yeah, looks like it's set long before the events of Game of Thrones, so that'll be nice. Hopefully it's far enough in the past that, like, we don't necessarily have to worry about certain characters getting to certain spots and certain things happening. Yeah. Makes it easier, but we'll have to wait and see. The series does drop this June. Uh, and then lastly, and certainly not leastly, we did get a shocking trailer during the Doctor Strange uh, premiere, uh, but that it then dropped on uh, YouTube and various social media sites a couple days after, uh, I think it was either Friday or Saturday, one of the two. Uh, Saturday, I think. It was the trailer for the upcoming Avatar, The Way of Water. This, of course, the sequel to the first Avatar film from James Cameron. Uh, it did rake in a shitload of views, though, so clearly some people are either A, interested, B, holy shit, this is really happening, or wait, this isn't a sequel to the... To the anime, is it? Uh, according to an article from The Hollywood Reporter, uh, which reads in part, quote, the teaser finished its first 24-hour online window with 148.6 million views. Wow. In including 23 million views from China alone. This according to Disney and 20th Century. Uh, that The article goes on to say, that's ahead of recent Star Wars films, including Star Wars The Rise of Skywalker. Like Avatar 2, the teaser trailer for that film also played exclusively in theaters first. Uh, so I guess the trailer looks okay. You know, I'm it, I'm not wowed by it. Like visually, it looks stunning, but that's a James Cameron movie for you. I just hope that the story is better than the first one. I mean, let's hope, because I know that was a criticism a lot of people had about the first movie was that the story was way too simple, way too basic. Hopefully Cameron took that criticism to heart and, and improved the story a little bit. It's, it's astounding for me to see, though, because this is the first movie I can think of that has waited so long for its sequel that the anticipation for the sequel has lapsed and it's fallen into the category of nostalgia. That, like, people might be excited for it because of the nostalgia. I'll be honest, man. I don't care about seeing this movie. I mean, the, the tr I might, you know, and I'm not even on the fence. I'm kind of, like, not even sitting on the fence yet. I'm like, eh, I don't really want to. But, like, 
if I see another trailer and the story looks interesting enough, and maybe if I wait for reviews and hear what they say, then I'll make a decision. But am I going to be buying tickets, you know, the day they go on sale? No. Like it, It's a wait and see for like, me. Like, here's the thing with it. Avatar was good for its time. Yeah. And the thing about Avatar, which will only stand out, and I think this is the only thing that if you ever talk to fans about this movie... It's the first thing that comes to mind. Right. It's beautiful. Oh, yeah, it's, visually. It's visually, it, it might be the most visually impressive movie of all time. And it brought 3D back for a hot minute. A couple of years. A couple of years. Like I said, yeah, it was yeah. a hot minute. Yeah. But it wore off, mm-hmm. and in my opinion, it doesn't hold up to this day. Because it borrows from too many other movies. Yeah, it does. Like, the script is very yeah. you know, basic. Like, it's just... There's nothing in there that's so captivating about the action, storyline, mm-hmm. anything. Visually, yeah, I'm there all day. Yeah. But it's also like, yeah, why, you know, like. I, mean, I, I, I saw the movie in theaters with a girl I was dating at the time. You know, when we were going out on a date, it was New Year's Eve. Mm-hmm. Saw it in theaters. And then I got it for, I think, Christmas the following year. Maybe my, maybe my birthday uh, the following year. Sure. And because I wanted it, I, I, I thought I'd be excited to watch it, you know, and I got it, but I wanted the Blu-ray, it wasn't available, it was sold out at the, I think my mom went to Target, it was sold out at Target, because uh, I think at that point we still didn't have a Best Buy yet. Okay. Uh, uh, so she went to Target, sold out at Target, but they did, uh, the Blu-ray, but they did have like a special edition DVD version, which had the theatrical release, the extended cut, and then the director's cut. Okay. Which the director's cut added something like a half hour onto the movie or something crazy, you know, and then we flash forward to uh, New Year's Eve the following year. So it's been one year since I'd seen the movie. And we were supposed to go out as a family to watch a movie. But the theater we were going to close early for some reason. I never did find out why. Mm-hmm. So we're like, oh, what are we going to go back and watch? I'm like, well, mom hadn't seen the Avatar. I'm like, well, I did get, get Avatar. I mean, we can watch that if you want. So I watched that with them. That's the only time I've seen the movie out of theater. Now, I've, I've been flipping channels and seen it on TV, but I've never sat there and actually watched the movie on TV. I've legitimately not watched it start to finish in over 10 years, and I've had no urge to. I mean, I'll be honest. I wanted to own the movie, and I thought I would want to watch it You know, when I when it came time to own it, yeah. but I never did. And I think, it, I think were it not for the fact that the theater I went to that night a year later after I saw it were closed, I probably would have never seen the movie after I, I left the theaters. I agree. I mean, that's the same thing, man. Like, I haven't seen it since, and I'm not, you know, really amped to see it again. Like, I'm sorry. It's just, it's not moving the needle for me. And the fact that they've got, like, five sequels lined up, I... Something like that, yeah. Unless you're going to reinvent the visual experience at the movie theaters, I don't care. Like, I will probably go there because I like to go to movies. But if you're asking, like, am I super amped up? No, I'm not. And I'm sorry, I'm not going to get amped up about this. This is just not doing enough for me to give that much of a care about. No. Sorry, just going to put that out there. All right, so for my one shots, got to talk some Doctor Who. Ooh. So Shuri Gawa is going to be your 14th Doctor. Nice. So he'll be replacing Jodie Whittaker. Super excited about this. Uh, I just cannot wait to see what he's going to bring to the role. Sex education is where he's most well known for. Okay. Uh, I've caught a little bit of that show and he's great on it. So I am very, very excited to see what he's going to do as the next doctor replacement. Yeah. And like I say, it, it's always something with the doctors. It's a very big thing to get oh, that yeah. role and to see him get this. I am super all in about. Well, and isn't this also with uh, Stephen Moffat returning to produce? I believe so. So, that yeah, that's going to be a very interesting season. Yeah, so definitely to see Shooty uh, take over the TARDIS. I will be there definitely checking it out when it's officially announced when he's taking over the role. And like I say, uh, Jodie Whittaker's run, I know it's been a little polarizing with fans. Sure. But I don't think it matters that much to me. You know, like, I thought it was good. Yeah. I just don't think she had a lot of great stuff to work with. Yeah. But for Shooty, who will be the first black Doctor Who, yep. I'm super excited where they go with him about this as yeah. well, too. So yeah. definitely cannot wait to check that out when it comes out. And obviously, this past weekend was free comic book day. Yeah. So locally in the 607, shout out to Sound Around, Vessel New York, Vessel Parkway, was doing a big, big event. The line was coming out the door. A lot of happy people there. A lot of cosplay going on. Our friends from Excite Wrestling were providing the uh, 
sequence of events, shall we say. Mm-hmm. Uh, Batman took on the Joker, the Riddler. So if Sean Carr misses the next Excite show, well, you know why. Oh, exactly. Uh, Bane showed up. Yeah. So that was cool. No Penguin. Bummer. Oh, we had an idea who was going to be the Penguin, but uh, according to him, it was, uh, hey, buddy, I don't want to put my suit on. <laughs> so maybe next year we got to talk to him about that. But it was very cool to see them put on. Justin, incredible cosplay, who's been on the podcast before. He is one of the biggest masterminds of cosplay there. He definitely got the crowd going for that. It was such a cool event to bear witness to. If you want to find out that footage, go to ODPH Podcast TikTok. And I actually shared it on Facebook, too. And I know a bunch of the wrestlers from Excited have been sharing it, too. It was a very cool event. A lot of free comics coming out. A lot of good stuff to pick up. And I'll even shout out locally to Fat Cat Books over on Main Street in Johnson City, too. They had a big event going on as well. It's very cool just to go in there, get some free comics, and talk fandom. And I got talking to a lot of it. Our good friend Tom from Off the Cuff Gaming, he was there. Oh, yeah. Billy from Floodlands, the hand of the king himself, he showed up. It was, it was a good time had by all. Picked up some issues as well, too. Definitely got to shout out the Valiant Free comic book day uh, sampler. They gave a lot of stuff out. So if you want to get introduced to that universe, see if you can go track a copy down. Such a good time at the comic shops. You can't go wrong with that. Uh, This week's comic picks, though, from DC Comics, the Jurassic League. Pat, what happens if you mix the Justice League with dinosaurs? Uh, Insanity. You get a badass comic done by Daniel Warren Johnson. That is all I need to say about that. And on the Marvel side of things, a little more quieter week, I would say. You know, it, it's not exactly grabbing the needle so much except for Captain America's symbol of truth. Like, that's the one that's jumping out to me about this. But there is a lot of good picks there as well, too, from the X-Men line as, as well. It's kind of a little heavier week with that. And on parlay points, Comixology Originals always doing big work, man. I preach about this all the time. I say this line in the comic blog each and every week. I mean every word of this. The Comixology Unlimited deal is one of the best deals in all of comics because you get these books for free on your subscription. You can read them. And then you can buy them and then have them for your own thing. This makes so much sense because you get introduced to so many different cool comics that you are not used to seeing. And for me, this is another one of them. It's called Cold Iron, number one by Andy Diggle and Nick Brokenshire. Mm. And it's dealing with a lot of Celtic mythology. It's kind of crossing into like the fantasy world. It comes over to our world. And how this singer is now stumbled upon this orphan girl. And they're trying to survive the night from, from creatures coming through. It's a very, very cool read. Definitely highly recommend that. Also on Comixology Originals this week was Love and War number 2. The rom-com involving Tug of War continues on. Mm. So it's definitely a fun read if you're into romantic comedies. It's not really my wheelbarrow, but I do enjoy the series. I think it's very, very fun. I think it's very energetic. It's got a lot of cool moments in there that just kind of, you know, bring a smile to your face because, let's face it, it's, it's a lighthearted book, and that's what it's meant to be. Coming out from Boom Studios, shout out to Boom. They got a monster on their hand. It's called Grim, and this is such a dope book. Uh, written by Stephanie Phillips, drawn by Flaviano. Mm-hmm. And this is a story basically about how a reaper has taken a soul to the afterlife, but something goes wrong. Of course it does. And just the insanity that follows through. It's visually impressive. I tell you what, if you're not singing Don't Fear the Reaper by the end of this book, I don't know what's wrong with you. It is so damn cool. The artwork is just popping off. I'm going to show Pad here, too. I like to get his honest reaction when I show it. Interesting. How cool. Like, how dope is that? That looks good. Yeah, Flaviano did his thing, man. So this is something to definitely sink your teeth into and definitely run with. They got a very cool trailer out on YouTube as well. Mm. So if you haven't checked that out as well, I'm going to see if I'll re-add it into the blog, and definitely you can see for yourself. I think they do a lot of cool stuff at Boom. And not to be outdone... One of our favorite franchises. Mighty Morphin number 19. Oh. Mac Room, Moises Hidalgo. Uh, definitely came back in a very strong way. Like What they're doing over there in the in the Mighty Morphin universe is some of the best work in comics. Mm-hmm. I know a lot of times like we always think, well, Mighty Morphin, oh, it's just a kid's show, blah, blah, blah. They're doing some really cool things over this book. And obviously the fallout from the Altarian War is still reigning true. They kind of do a split story as they're doing also with Power Rangers, how they do the split there. Right. And it's all going into the legacy uh, writing of issue 100. So oh, okay. definitely some cool stuff to check out there. So you want to make sure you're going to your local comic shops, picking those books up. If you want to do a little more deep dive, the blogs are right there on Parlay Points. You just click on it, subscribe to the RSS feed. It'll be right there for you each week. 
like to give you my picks of that because I know we can talk Marvel, we can talk DC all the time, but the indie scene right now is booming, booming. So definitely make sure you go out there, support indie comics, go support your favorite comic shops where you are locally. Free Comic Book Day should have been a great gateway. Go down there, go give them your business because it's always supporting local here on the 607 Podcast Network of Families and definitely support your favorite independent comic podcasts as well. That all being said, Pat, music you heard on this edition of the ODPH, is that a shout at the robots? Mm-hmm. They're fantastic people. They're as indie as it gets. Uh, unfortunately, they have suspended their Patreon for a little bit. Mm. They're going to come back when they got a little more stuff coming because they're too busy in the works making the new album. I understand that. I can get on down with that. But, Pat, if I want to find out everything going on with Shout, where do I go? ODPHpodcast.com. Right on. Swinging over your music section. You check out them. You check out Floodlands. You check out Brian Wolf. New EP dropping. June 3rd. Second Suitor. They got some shows lined up. Tom Jolu snuck an EP out under everybody's nose. Wow. And Yard Party's there. Man, all the music that you hear on the ODPH Podcast Network, 607 Podcast Network in general, is there. Go support the hell out of them. They're all fantastic people. While you're there, check out the directory. Because, Pat, how many providers are we on now? 20,022. Sounds about right. I thought it was going to be 21, but you tell you what, you called that shot, you know it. So if we're not on your favorite podcast provider, let us know. We'll try fixing that for you. That's why we make it so easy so you don't miss one episode of content. Also, while you're at the website, check out the classified section, which has friends of the show, organizational links supporting Black Lives Matter, all the amazing pod groups we're in via the Pod Chaser pages, even though everybody's going to good pods these days, and you should too because we do a lot of good work there. So shout out to the Inner Circle, shout out to the Apocalypse, and of course shout out to the family at 607 Podcast and 8122 Productions. And we got a big week lined up next week because it is live stream for the Cure Time Pad. Mm. So you know you can dro- you got to drop that follow for twitch.tv slash live stream for F-O-R, The Cure. And May 19th through the 21st, some of the baddest content creators on the planet, the creme de la creme, are going to be donating their time to raise money for the Cancer Research Institute for a future hashtag immune to cancer. Early donations are up right now. So if you haven't done it yet, the link is right on the front page of the ODPH podcast site. Go click it. It'll take you everywhere you need to go and make sure you are supporting this event. Give a social share at the very least. Let's make this thing trend, baby. And you know the 607 Podcast will be doing a live 607 TWS on Friday night, 11 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. We're going to close out night two. Rich and I are going to come up with something. I've heard wrestling trivia. I've heard a couple other ideas. It will be pro wrestling because I know we've had a lot of people ask us about doing pro wrestling, so that's what we're going to do. So make sure you drop that follow. Check that out. Check out the T Public store. You know what time it is over there. Nuff said. Parlay points, new blogs dropping, maybe a wrestling one if, you know, somebody ever sends some stuff on time. I can keep my fingers crossed. I'm not. I know you're not, but I have hope. I have faith. I don't waver. All of that and so much more. If it's ODPH, it can be found at odphpodcast.com. That's all I got for this week. So for the one and only Padawan J. Thank you, thank you. I'm your host, Ken M. Thank you, as always, for listening to the ODPH Podcast, better known as the Ocho Duro Parlay Hour. We'll see you next time. <laughs>